Do you know what your lifetime risk of breast cancer is? Or the types of breast cancer and how it is staged? What about how breast cancer is managed? Well, by the end of this tutorial, you'll be able to confidently answer those questions and more. In breast part one, we ran through benign breast disease and triple assessment of breast lumps. But in this tutorial, I'm going to teach you all you need to know about breast cancer. So let's get started. Some facts you need to know. Breast cancer is the most common cancer in the UK with around 40,000 new cases each year. Despite that fact, it is rare in men. Second most common is lung cancer, then followed by prostate and then bowel cancer. When it comes to breast cancer, if you are a female, your lifetime risk is one in nine in the UK, rarely presenting in younger than the age of 35. Its incidence rises rapidly until around the age of 50. Around 60% of patients with breast cancer present with symptomatic disease and 40% are picked up with screening. Breast cancer screening started in the UK in 1988 and all women between the ages of 50 and 70 are invited for a mammogram every three years to try and catch breast cancer early. The etiology of breast cancer is multifactorial. An increased lifetime exposure to oestrogen is thought to increase the risk of breast cancer. This includes early menarche, late first pregnancy, nulliparity, late menopause, taking the combined contraceptive pill, and obesity. When it comes to genetics, 5% of the cases have an identifiable genetic predisposition. This includes BRCA1 and BRCA2 genetic mutations, which result in the patient having a high risk of developing breast or ovarian cancer. In breast part one, we went through the features of the history examination that would raise our suspicion of malignancy when it came to assessing a patient with a breast lump. And we also talked about triple assessment. Just to recap, triple assessment means examination of the breast, imaging the breast, and then a fine needle aspirate of the lump. After biopsy, the malignant lesion can either be in situ or invasive. An in situ carcinoma is contained within an intact epithelial basement membrane. And an invasive carcinoma means that the cancer cells have gone beyond the basement membrane and therefore have the potential to get into the lymphatics and vasculature. The in situ carcinomas can be divided up into ductal and lobular subtypes. Ductal carcinoma in situ or DCIS is a clonal proliferation of ductal luminal cells that accumulate into the lumen of the duct. Invasive ductal carcinomas develops in 50% of patients with untreated DCIS within about 10 years of diagnosis. Lobular carcinomas in situ develops from cells lining the lobules. It rarely presents as a lump and can be picked up on screening through biopsies performed in benign breast lesions. Invasive lobular carcinomas represents 10% of all breast cancers. Only 10% of patients with LCIS develop invasive lobular carcinoma. It is often multifocal and may be bilateral. Other types of invasive breast cancers are rare. They include medullary, mucinous and tubular carcinomas. After a diagnosis of breast cancer has been confirmed, the patient is fully investigated. We can split up these tests into those that look at the baseline status, those that look at the tumour, then those that look at the lymph nodes and finally those that look for distant metastasis. When it comes to a baseline status, we can perform a set of blood tests for reference during treatment. Other tests that may be performed include a DEXA scan to assess the bone mineral density as certain hormone treatments can adversely affect it. When it comes to the tumour itself, biopsies or the surgical resected specimen are sent for immunohistochemistry studies. This will determine the oestrogen and HER2 receptor status, which guides the use of adjuvant hormone therapy, as we will see soon. Imaging of the breast with an MRI isn't needed unless we are considering breast preservation surgery, in which case we need this to assess the size and position of the tumour. When it comes to lymph node status, we can perform an ultrasound of the axilla to see if there is any suspicious looking nodes. If so, then a guided lymph node needle biopsy can be performed and this will guide management. Finally, when it comes to looking for metastatic disease, those tests we performed 
earlier may give us a clue to the presence of liver metastases if the liver function is abnormal or bone metastases if the calcium and alkaline phosphatase are raised. If we suspect bone metastases, a bone isotope scan may be performed in addition to a staging CT of the chest and abdomen. Now that the investigations are complete, we can stage the patient. Remember, when we talk about the grade of cancer, we're referring to how aggressive the cells are in terms of their potential to grow quickly, invade and metastasize. It is the grade that is assessed by looking down a microscope. Staging is about the TNM system. With respect to breast cancer, this relates to the size of the tumour, the degree of nodal metastatic involvement and the presence of distant organ metastasis. With all this information, the patient is then discussed by a multidisciplinary team and in clinic, the patient is supported and can make an informed decision about how to proceed. The prime treatment modality for breast cancer is surgical followed by adjuvant therapy, which means therapy that begins after surgery. The particular treatment regimen will depend on the individual patient and the type of breast cancer they have. Let's run through the principles. Firstly, surgery can either be a mastectomy with or without breast reconstruction or breast conserving, in other words, a wired local excision. During surgery, the lymph nodes may be checked for metastasis by what is known as a sentinel lymph node biopsy. A blue dye or radioactive isotope or sometimes both, is injected peritumorally or subdermally injected in the areola within the same quadrant as the tumour. Then the surgeon identifies the lymph node to which the dye has travelled. This node is sent to the lab and if it is positive for cancer, then an auxiliary lymph node dissection, also known as auxiliary clearance, is carried out. If there are no cancer cells in the central node, then auxiliary clearance surgery can be avoided, sparing the patient the risks of developing lymphedema. Next up is adjuvant treatment, which must be started as soon as possible after surgery. The precise treatment that is given will depend on factors such as the individual patient, the stage of disease, the receptor status, and whether the patient is pre- or post-menopausal. Adjuvant therapy may be either local treatment, so directed at reducing the risk of disease recurrence in the breast or adjuvant treatment can be systemic designed to kill undetectable cells that are harboring somewhere distant. Locally treatment is radiotherapy. There are many types and I wouldn't worry too much about the details. Suffice to say that in most patients it is indicated although according to NICE guidelines in the UK some people don't need it. For example, certain low-risk patients who have had a mastectomy and are node negative. Axilla or supraclavicular fossa radiotherapy will depend on the lymph node positivity and whether or not the patient has had an axillary clearance for this. Systemically, there is hormonal and chemotherapy treatments. There are a range of chemotherapeutic agents and examples include docetaxel, capicitabine, and venerelbin. Hormonal therapy would depend on the receptor status of cancer, as we mentioned earlier. So estrogen receptor positive patients may benefit from blocking activation of this receptor that may otherwise contribute to progression of the cancer. So we can try to block this receptor by giving an antagonist such as tamoxifen. Or we could reduce the serum levels of estrogen by giving an aromatase inhibitor such as anastrozole or letrozole. This works by reducing the conversion of steroids to estrogen by the aromatase enzyme. The other receptor we mentioned earlier is the HER2 receptor. In HER2 receptor positivity, we may consider the monoclonal antibody trastuzumab, also known as Herceptin, which induces cytotoxicity in cells that overexpress this HER2 receptor. 5-10% to 10 of patients have metastases when they present. Breast has a particular tendency to metastasize to bone and brain. In certain patients with limited brain metastases, resection may be offered. In patients with bone metastases, the treatment is radiotherapy and bisphosphonates. 
Complications may arise at any stage of treatment. Important ones include issues involving arm mobility, lymphedema of the arm and menopausal symptoms. Certain adjuvant treatments confer specific potential side effects, for example, cardiac toxicity with the use of Herceptin. In general, the whole experience of having breast cancer and receiving treatment can be very upsetting and traumatic for the patient. It is important that the right emotional and psychological support is available. Overall, breast cancer has a five-year survival rate of greater than 85% and a 10-year survival rate of around 75%. And this will depend on the stage and the grade of the patient's disease. To summarize breast cancer, it is the commonest in the UK and men can get it too. There's a breast cancer screening program and is thought to have brought down the mortality from breast cancer significantly. Risk factors are related to estrogen exposure and family history. Specific genes include BRCA1 and BRCA2. Following triple assessment, a diagnosis of either in situ or invasive disease may be made. A patient's baseline status is investigated together with the tumor's receptor status and nodal status, and any presence of metastasis. We briefly mentioned the importance of the multidisciplinary team in ensuring a supportive environment for the patient. When it comes to treatment, the mainstay is surgical, which could involve breast conserving surgery or a mastectomy with or without breast reconstruction. Sentinel node biopsy will help us decide whether to perform axillary clearance. Following surgery, adjuvant treatment depends on various factors. Radiotherapy targets local disease and hormonal therapy and chemotherapy targets distant disease. Finally, important complications include lymphedema and menopausal symptoms. Breast cancer can be frightening, but many patients do well. Thank you for watching this tutorial on malignant breast disease. I'm Sam Parker. Take care.